live this morning at 11 o'clock Saturday morning here from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And it's an honor to be with you as we continue my talk series from my DVD, Explaining the Faith. As I'm giving you each Saturday just a little talk, kind of a uh, preview of what's on the DVD. And so we hope at the end, when we put up the information on the DVD, how to order it, that you'll consider getting these talks. And today we have a special talk because it's so right now become problematic with so many people leaving our Catholic faith and leaving what is the one true faith. And so I wanna explain very truthfully why the Catholic faith has the fullness of the truth and how many black eyes we're getting in the media and in society today. And I'm gonna talk about why we need to understand that this is the religion founded by Jesus Christ, our Catholic faith. And so stay with me as we talk about this very important topic. We're gonna to talk about how you need to understand and defend things like the saints, Mary, um, the Eucharist, the mass, um, Bible alone, faith alone, purgatory, the Pope, saints, relics, all these good things. All right, now, not is my purpose is not in any way to degrade any other religions. No, you will hear in my words nothing of that sort. I'm not here to lower any other faith like this. I'm here to elevate our faith to the proper place that it belongs. We as Catholics are the most misunderstood religion. Um, like I said, Bible only, faith alone, Pope, saints, relics, purgatory, Mary, the Eucharist. This is what we're gonna talk about today. Now on my, um, as you can see, Brother Mark put the first slide. I'm Father Chris Alar coming here from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And um, it's been exciting as they're telling us that we're, our churches are now gonna finally be able to open up. We're hoping for Pentecost and that's gonna be very important. But I wanna start with this, Fulton Sheen. As you can see on your screen, um, a great Catholic bishop, he was quoted as saying no more than a hundred people probably in the world hate what really is the Catholic Church, but many hate what they think is the Catholic Church. That quote is very important because what it is is people dislike the Catholic Church with a misunderstanding of what the Catholic Church actually is. And we're gonna show you today and we're gonna answer that question, is the Catholic Church needed for salvation? And what about the church's phrase, there's no out salvation outside the Catholic Church? And how about this, can a non-Catholic be saved? Yes, but if a non-Catholic can be saved, how can the church teach there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church? Doesn't that seem contradictory? Stay with us as we will be answering that question. All right, I'm doing this talk because we are losing so many Catholics. The numbers are astounding. The new Pew study that came out says only 17% of Catholics think that our faith is the true faith. Oh my goodness. Only 17% of Catholics think our faith is the one true faith. All the others are much higher. Um, the Jehovah Witnesses are like at the top and the Mormons. Uh, Muslims are at the top and, and Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. They believe their faith is the one true faith and yet only 17% of Catholics do. This is unacceptable. It does matter what we are. It does matter what our faith is. Our Catholic Church has made mistakes because remember, she is human and divine. In her human nature, she will fail, but in her divine nature, she will totally give you the truth. All right, let's look at this. The Catholic Church, few people realize, built Western civilization. You ever been to a university? How about a hospital? Ever been helped by a charity? What about furthering your education? 
Thank the Catholic Church. Every day, the Catholic Church feeds, houses, clothes, educates more people than any other organization in the world. This is the Catholic faith. This could all end if some in government want their own way and, um, and take the status away of the charity of the Catholic Church because then the taxpayers will have to fund all of those costs. So it really, we have to be careful when we want to jump on to saying, strip the Catholic Church of her tax exemption, because then guess what? The taxpayers are going to have to pick up all of those bills. So it's really something we need to pray about. All right. Today, there are almost 40,000 Christian denominations in the world today, all believing something different, or they would be the same religion. On your slide, you can see on the screen, who started your church. Now, God bless, these people are good people. There's, there's elements of the truth in all of these religions. They really are. But you can't have more than one truth. So if we can't have more than one truth, which truth is the right one? You know, when I was um, younger, I, um, I lived in um, many different places uh, in the United States. I most recently, before becoming a Marian father, lived in North Carolina. And all my neighbors, God bless them, they were wonderful people. In fact, the holiest young lady I ever knew in my life was my little 98-pound Baptist secretary. And, um, and when I had my own business in North Carolina. And um, all my neighbors were Baptists. God bless them. They were good, good people. But I always ask the question, who started the Baptist religion? And the answer is John Smith in 1609. Well, then I, before that, I lived in Utah. And God bless them. They were wonderful people. We loved our time in Salt Lake City. Our neighbors were all Mormons. God bless them. There was no crime. The neighbors were like family. It was just a great place and great people. But I have to ask you, who started the Mormon religion? Joseph Smith in 1830. Then I lived in Michigan. I grew up in Detroit. And my neighbors were Episcopalian. And same thing, great people, wonderful neighbors, beautiful souls. But I ask you, who started the Episcopalian religion. Some say Henry VIII, that was actually the Anglican, but in America, the Episcopalian religion was started in 1789 by Samuel Seabury. Now, God bless Samuel Seabury, but he's not Jesus Christ. As good of a man, only the Catholic Church even claims that their religion was started in 33 A.D., no other religion can trace the roots back to 33 AD except our Catholic faith. So who started the Catholic Church? Nobody is mentioned except Jesus, Jesus himself. Nobody else even claims to have started the Catholic Church other than Jesus. You know, um, for 1,500 years, there was only the Catholic Church there were no other Christian religions for 1,500 years. So I, I have to start by asking this question. If there was only the Catholic Church for 1,500 years, we have to ask ourselves to go to the Bible. Now, one of the missions of Jesus Christ in the Bible was to start a church. It says it, his own words. Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church, all right? Which church? Okay, we know Jesus founded a church. He said, Peter's the rock who will be built upon it. Now, here's my question. Does anybody really believe that Jesus Christ was going to come to earth, and he did, and start a church, which he said he did, but he was going to do that, start this church, and then say, I'm going to start a church, but I'm going to get it wrong for 1,500 years. And then Martin Luther's going to come and get it right. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, we have our brokenness in the human nature of the church, but you know what? In her divine nature, it's from God. It's from God, and the gates of hell will not prevail. All right. 
our church fathers, to them there was only one church. And do you know what two topics the church fathers talked about more than any other, any other topics for 1,500 years? You guessed it, Mary and the Eucharist. Two things uniquely Catholic. Well, Father, my, my Protestant faith has communion. No, it's symbolic. Nobody teaches transubstantiation that our bread actually becomes the body and blood of Christ, except the Catholic faith. And that's John 6, verse 52. Talking about what it is, is uniquely Catholic. Mary and the Eucharist, the church fathers, for centuries, John Chrysostom, uh, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, all of them for 1,500 years talked about Mary and the Eucharist more than anything else, and those are the only two things that are uniquely Catholic. The sacraments, very much important. All right, now on the next slide, you can see this is what's happening in our world today. All right, you see these massive megachurches, um, and they're drawing in millions, and especially ex-Catholics. And you know, I was flipping through the TV one night at a parish mission trying to find EWTN, and I came across this, probably the most well-known pastor in the United, or preacher in the United States. He has the biggest church in the United States. And I'm listening to him speak, and he's talking about we don't put God in a box. And you knew who he was talking about. He was talking about us Catholics, right? Even though the tabernacle is God's dwelling place on earth, what do you think God made the Ark of the Covenant for, right? And the Holy of Holies. And the tabernacle is the, the, the dwelling place of God. And he says, and I'm, I'm dumbfounded as I'm watching it, and he says, if you want, if, if you follow Jesus, you'll get that new car. If you follow Jesus, you'll get that new house. If you follow Jesus, you'll get that promotion at work. If you follow Jesus, you'll get that beautiful new wife. You know, don't fall for this. This is sweeping millions of Catholics away. It's called the gospel of prosperity, and it's dangerous. It's utterly dangerous. That is not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow me. Yeah, that's why Catholicism is not popular, but it's the truth. It is purely the truth. And that doesn't mean that we have to hate our crosses. No, what it means is those crosses are our way to salvation, just like Jesus. On his way to Calvary, yes, the cross exists, but it's not the last word. The last word is the, the resurrection, not the cross. And so we have to realize that there is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. And these gospels of prosperity, they don't get it. All right, now. Jesus, true, is the one mediator, but Jesus' body is the church. So when we go through the church, we are going through Christ, his very body, as our mediator. Saints are not mediators. That's what we are attacked a lot of times as Catholics. Saints are advocates. They're intercessors. It's different. Now, the world's oldest continuous institution Running today is the Catholic Church, which has to mean it's divine. Despite all our brokenness in the church and our humanness, we still exist because the gates of hell won't prevail. Even um, Napoleon, who was speaking with a cardinal, said, I'm going to destroy the Catholic Church. And that cardinal looked at Napoleon and he said, you think so? And he's like, yeah. And he says, gee, priests and bishops have been trying to do that for 1,800 years. What makes you think you can destroy it? So what's the moral to that? The moral to that is in our, in our human nature, we are stupid. There's been bad priests and bad bishops, but it doesn't take away the teaching of the truth. And that's why we don't abandon the truth, even though we had stupid priests and bishops. I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. All right. The mistakes that we have made in the church mean that it is human, but I'm not excusing them. We're going to talk about the church scandal uh, at the end of this talk here. I'm briefly going to say a few words on it. But the Bible speaks of two kinds of tradition. It says the human tradition is wrong. And a lot of people point to the Catholic Church saying you're all about human tradition. Uh-uh. There's another tradition mentioned in the Bible called apostolic 
And this apostolic tradition means from the apostles, apostolic handed down to us in today's world. This apostolic succession is incredible because it means right from Jesus, he gave power to his first apostles, his first priests. And when those apostles, we saw it the other day with St. Matthias, when one dies and another needs to be replaced, they would lay hands on that next priest and give him the power of the Holy Spirit of ordination. Do you know that every living Catholic priest alive today, despite his brokenness, when he was ordained a priest, hands were laid on his head by a bishop. And when that bishop was ordained a priest, hands were laid on him by a bishop. And when that bishop was ordained a priest, hands were laid on him by a bishop. All the way back, so on and so forth, all the way back to one of the 12 apostles and actually Jesus Christ. That's unbelievable. To know when Bishop Holly put his hands on my head and then some bishop put hands on his head when he was ordained and then some bishop put hands on his head when he was ordained, that every living priest can be traced physically, physically, by touching. That means Jesus touched a head and that person touched a head and that person touched a head going right down to me. That is unbelievable. So if you want a blessing by a priest, have him lay his hands on your head. Ask for that blessing. Now, he's not ordaining you, but he can give you a blessing, and you know that there's an unbroken line in your priest that has been unbroken from the time of Jesus all the way down to the priest. This is unbelievable. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're all about these other things. It's only Bible. It's Bible only. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but the Jews, they had the same three traditions that we base our faith on. You know, our Catholic faith has three legs to our stool, right? We have the magisterium, we have scripture, and we have oral tradition. This is exactly, exactly like the Jews. Do you know the Jews had a magisterium? We have a magisterium. It's called the College of Bishops and Cardinals, right? The Jews had a magisterium. It's called the teaching authority of Moses. You know, we have scripture. It's called the Old and New Testament. The Jews had scripture, the Torah, and the Ten Commandments. We have tradition. Do you know the Jews also counted on tradition? It came down with Moses from the mountain, from Mount Sinai, and is throughout the Old Testament. So we have the same three legs as the Jewish stool. Why would somebody, Christians come from the Jews, say, you Catholics, you have three legs of stool, you're only supposed to have scripture. No. We need tradition and we need um, uh, the authority, excuse me, um, the majesty, yeah, the authority of the magisterium. So let's look at this. Let's start with Bible only, sola scriptura. You see the slide up on your page. There's a, there's a picture of the Bible. Now, many non-Catholics will tell us it's only about the Bible, sola scriptura. Well, do you know that sola scriptura is not in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we are only to rely only on the Bible. Now, a couple things that we need to look at. We are Bible-based. Scripture is needed, is needed, but it's not sufficient. In other words, we need the other legs, the magisterium, a teaching authority, and the tradition passed down from Jesus to the apostles, to us. You see, the book, the Bible says... In the last chapter of John, that if all the books of the world were to to put what Jesus said and did, excuse me, if you were to write down what Jesus said and did, everything he said and did, all the books of the world could not contain it. Well, wait a minute here. The Bible's only this thick. So how could all the books of the world contain everything he said when the Bible's only this thick? It's not all the books of the world. Does that mean that those other things Jesus said and did are not important? Of course not. They come to us through tradition, not just scripture. Both are critically important. Now, sola scriptura is not in the Bible, but oral tradition is. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. This is very important. The, I hold fast to the traditions I teach you, both oral and written, Paul says. All right? Jesus never promised us a book, but he promised us an authority, an authority 
of the Catholic Church. You know, a lot of people say, well, Father, all you need is the Bible. Well, yes, we do need the Bible. And by the way, I have a question for you. Do we read the Bible as literally true? Answer the question, all right? Do we read the Bible as literally true? Some people are gonna say yes, some people are gonna say no. The answer is yes. Now go home tonight and cut off your right hand because the Bible says if it causes you to sin, cut it off. Wait a minute, Father, what are you talking about? Okay, the word literally in the original language doesn't mean how we use it. We read the Bible as literally true with the word literally meaning the message the author is trying to convey is true. So what is the message when Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off? The message is, if there's something in your life causing you to sin, get rid of it. If it's a computer or an alcohol bottle or, or drugs or whatever it could be, even another person, you got to get rid of that. So that's what Jesus meant. But we do not read the Bible as literal lists, meaning we actually get a saw and slice off our hand. No. That's literalists. We don't do that. We read it as literally true, meaning the message is, if there's something in your life causing you to sin, get rid of it. That's just one example. All right. Now, as I said, Jesus never promised a book, but he promised an authority, the church. John 20, 23 says, the apostles, the church ministers, have the authority to forgive sins. I talked about this in my confession talk last week. To, to the apostles, Jesus said, whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. <clears throat> so what that means is heaven has to follow the priest. And if you didn't hear my talk last week, it's out there on Facebook and YouTube called uh, Confession. It was a talk about confession. And in it, I explained that Christ gave that authority to the apostles to be able to forgive sins. And so this authority is the church. These apostles founded the church and passed it on to the living day, pre, current day priests. All right, so this is very important. What about 1 Timothy 3.15? Says the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. It tells us what is to make up the Bible. The church is that authority. You know, when I was in North Carolina, I had a good friend named Ed. He was a good man. And he was a fallen away Catholic. He now became Baptist, God bless him. And um, he would come into my room, or my office, I should say, and he would notice a lot of times I had my crucifix behind my chair. And I remember one day he came in and he had the Bible with him. And he said, uh, uh, you know, Chris, uh, can I speak with you? Because he's looking at my crucifix above my chair on the back wall. And he says, um, can I speak with you, Chris? And I said, uh, okay. And he says, Chris, and he pulls out that Bible and he starts <laughs> slapping the Bible. He said, Chris, this is all you need. You don't need all this other stuff. All you need is the Bible. That is all you need. You crazy Catholics are hung up on this tradition and the magisterium. I said, Ed, so were the Jews, just to let you know. And he said, but this is all you need, Chris. You don't need anything else but the Bible. This is it. And I said, okay, Ed, do you accept the authority of that Bible? He said, yeah. I said, do you accept every word in it as true? He said, yeah. I said, do you believe the authority in the authority from which it came? He said, yeah. I said, congratulations, Ed you accept the authority of the Catholic Church. He's like, huh? I said, Ed, you know where that Bible you're holding in your hand comes from? You have the same 27 books in that New Testament that we do, and in the Old Testament, you, uh, there's a difference of seven books, all right? M uh, Wisdom, uh, Sirach, Tobit, uh, Maccabees, those were in the original Bible, but you hold that same Bible other than those few books that we do. You know where that book came from, Ed? You know where that Bible came from? That Bible came from the councils of Carthage and Hippo in 393 and 397 AD from the Catholic bishops. They are the ones that determined 
which books were divinely inspired. Yes, ultimately they came from God, but there were all kinds of scriptures out there then. There was the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary. There was all kinds of Gospels. Who determined the four Gospels that you read, Ed? Who determined Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The Holy Spirit, yes. But who, what human tools declared it? The Holy Spirit, yes, but he used some human tools to do it. Those human tools were the Catholic bishops at the councils of Carthage and Hippo in 393 and 397. You see, Ed, the mass predates the Bible. You know why the Bible was written? The Bible was written to be read at the mass. This is what the Bible was for. This is what the Bible was created. This is what we have in our Catholic faith is the mass was started by Christ in 33 AD. The first scriptures, scriptures were not written for decades later. Decades later. And they were read, they were created, and the Bible was canonized. Now the scriptures existed before 393 and 397, but they were canonized into the volumes of the Testaments, the Old Testament, New Testament, in, in 393 and 397 AD. People don't understand that. So what determined the canon of the Bible we have right now? The tradition of the Catholic Church. And I said to Ed, Ed, you cannot accept that Bible and reject the authority of the Catholic Church from which it came. That would be the same thing as, re as accepting the Constitution of the United States, but rejecting the Founding Fathers. And sadly, that's exactly what's happening today in our government. We are rejecting the founding fathers. This is craziness. It's the same thing that happened. You can't accept that authority, Ed, that authority of the Catholic Church because she gave us the Bible, the Holy Spirit. Yes, he inspired it, but it was put together by the Catholic bishops. They are the ones that canonized it and said, these are the inspired books. Now, we need an interpreter so that everyone will be able to interpret the Bible the way God wants it to be. If you don't have an interpreter, you have 40, I just showed that slide, right? 40,000 different Christian religions in the world today. Well, which one reads the Bible this way, the other reads the Bible this way, the other reads the Bible this way. Well, which one's the truth? One religion says the Bible does not condemn abortion. The other religion says the Bible does condemn abortion, which is the truth. You gotta have an authority. This is why the Catholic Church, the magisterium, is that authority to interpret that Bible for us. You know, the US Constitution has an interpreter, the US Supreme Court. When she's doing her job, I can't just go out and say, well, I think the Constitution means this. As a business owner, I couldn't just mistreat an employee and say, well, you know what? That's my constitutional right because that's how I read the Constitution. I read the Constitution that I have a right to abuse my employee. No, I can't just interpret the Constitution my own way. Why? Because the Supreme Court says, no, the Constitution says this. It's the same way with the Bible. The, 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 the Constitution is explained and interpreted by the Supreme Court, just like the Bible needs to be explained and interpreted by a church. That's why we have the Catholic Church. You know, nine out of 10 early Christians could not read. So how did they learn? Tradition. This is what is making our three legs of our Catholic faith. Where did they learn their faith? The scriptures, yes, this is true, but also the mass. The scriptures, as I said, were written, or excuse me, were put together in the Bible to be read at the Mass. The Bible, this is very important. The Mass came before the Bible. The scriptures even, the Mass came even before the first written scripture. Jesus never wrote a word, but he gave us the Mass before he died in the upper room. All right, so let's finish up with Bible here. You know, um, I've told this story before, but what the heck, I'll tell it again. I, um, I should be embarrassed to admit this, but what the heck. Um, you know, when I moved down to North Carolina to start my own business uh, about 20, over 20 years, 20 years ago, I was one of the first guys ever to try online dating. And I said, I should be embarrassed, but what the heck. You know, I was in a, 
I started my business and I just, I worked seven days a week. I was there every night till midnight and I never had any kind of social life. And I remember one Saturday night I was listening to the radio and they were broadcasting from some club in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they said, you know what, if you're not down here tonight, you're really lame kind of thing, you know? And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, here I am in the office on a Saturday night at 10 o'clock at night, I am lame. And I decided I was going to try to get more socially active because I, 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 up until then, didn't have a chance. And so um, I actually went online and um, did the first online dating. When I, when I got online, there was probably all the seven girls on the internet doing online dating. And well, anyway, I, I started chatting with this one lady who seemed very nice, professional, and we, we wrote each other and exchanged pictures, and we agreed to meet. And uh, this was in Charlotte, and she was a professional and nice lady, and, and I didn't want to make her uncomfortable, so I didn't want to pick her up at her house asking her where she lived. So we agreed to meet at a restaurant in Charlotte. And as we're at the restaurant and we're eating, what is the f one thing they tell us never to bring up on a first date, right? Religion and politics, right? So there I am, and I'm eating, and all of a sudden, she pops the question. What question, you ask? Yeah. So, what religion are you? And as I'm eating my spaghetti, I choke up Catholic, and she goes, <gasps> and she, she literally gasped. She goes, how, how can you belong to religion that burn Bibles, chained them to rocks, and put them into Latin so nobody could read them. And you know what my reaction was? We did. I mean, when you don't know your faith, this is a problem. And so she says, yeah, you burn Bibles, you put them in a Latin so nobody could read them, and you chained them to rocks so nobody could have them. Let's look at this. Did the church chain Bibles to rocks? Yes, we did. But it wasn't so nobody could read them. It was so that everybody could read them. You see, back in the day, that was, there was no printing press, and it took a monk three years to copy one Bible. If you put that Bible out in the public square with no chain on it, it would have been gone in an hour, and then nobody could have it. So the importance was chain it to the center of the rock in town so everybody could view it and have it. Some of you may remember the days of the phone booth. You all remember the days of the phone booth? What was chained to the phone booth? The yellow pages. And it was chained so nobody would walk out with them. So everybody could have use of them. You all remember the pen at the bank, right? You have the pen at the bank. Is that chained so nobody could use the pen? No, it's chained so that the next person doesn't walk off with it, even inadvertently. So <clears throat> then let's talk about Latin. Yeah, the, the church put the Bible into Latin, but it wasn't so nobody could read it. It was because at that time in history, still the most language most spoken and read around the world was Latin. This is why the church put into Latin. It increased the reach of the Bible 20-fold. Oh, and then she said, your church burned Bibles. Did the church burn Bibles? Yes, it did but not the real Bible. The church only burned heretical Bibles. What is the government supposed to do when it finds counterfeit money? When the government finds counterfeit money, it burns it, all right? These other gospels are not inspired of the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Mary, the gospel of all these other things. They were heretical, not heretical necessarily, deuterocanonical, uh, excuse me, um, apocryphal. These were not inspired of the Holy Spirit, so the church did burn them. She was doing her job to protect the real Bible. It's like burning counterfeit money. You got to protect the real money. This isn't money, but it's, you see my point. All right, now, then she said, how could you belong to a religion that added books to the Bible? Remember I told you Maccabees and Wisdom and Sirach and Tobit. She said, how could you belong to a religion that added books to the Bible? You know what? The answer is, we didn't add books to the Bible. Martin Luther took them out. 
And then people will say, well, no, Father. Luther took out those seven books because they were not in the original Hebrew. He knew what he was doing. This is, Catholic Church is all phony. No. Go to the Dead Sea Scrolls today, and you will see that, in fact, we do have those seven books in the original Hebrew. All right, let's keep going. What about faith alone? Sola fide. Look up at your screen. Next slide. Faith alone. Sola fide, right? This one is important because when I moved down to Wal uh, excuse me, to Walmart, when I moved down to North Carolina, the very first night I lived in North Carolina, I went into a Walmart and I had my Benedict cross on me. And that Benedict cross on it is a corpus, meaning the body of Christ, just like crucifix that you see in any Catholic church. And this woman stopped me in Walmart and she said, you must be Catholic. And I said, yes, how did you know? You know, because I'm wearing this corpus of Christ on my crucifix, right? And she says, how can you belong to a religion? And just like the girl in the restaurant, she said that isn't biblical. And I said, what do you mean we're not biblical now? I had not come back fully to my Catholic faith yet. I didn't know it fully. And she says, you are not of the Bible, you Catholics. And I said, why? And she says, Romans 3.28. And like a good Catholic, I was, uh, what does Romans 3.28 say? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. So yes, I guess she had a point there. Romans 3.28, she said, you are saved by faith alone and not by works. She said, you Catholics don't believe that. You don't believe in the Bible. Is that true? Do we Catholics not believe in that statement, you are saved by faith alone and not by works? Is that against church teaching? Is that against the Catholic faith? You bet it is. That is against the Catholic faith. Well, then I told you right there, Father, you people are not, Catholic, or, uh, you're not biblical. You Catholics are not biblical. Well, here's, here's the problem. And this is why you need to know your Catholic faith. Because you are saved by faith alone and not by works, Romans 3.28. That's not what the Bible says. That's not Romans 3.28. You know what Romans 3.28 says? You are saved by faith. It does not have the word alone. Martin Luther added it. We believe we are saved by faith, not alone. Martin Luther added the word alone. And it says, not by works. That's where she stopped. But you want to know what Romans 3.28 really says? Not by works of the law. We believe that. So Romans 3.28 really says, you are saved by faith, and not by works of the law. Bingo, ding, ding. That is purely Catholic. So if you really want to know what Romans 3.28 says, what it says is purely Catholic. We are saved by faith, doesn't say the word alone, and not by works of the law. Works of the law aren't going to save us, but works of love, charity, you betcha. That's the way we show we are Christ-like. And people don't get this. The word alone was added by Martin Luther in Corinthians 13, 2. St. Paul says, faith without love is nothing and it cannot save. So right there tells you, Corinthians 13, 2. Faith without love is nothing and it cannot save. You know the only time faith alone appears in the Bible? Tell this to your non-Catholic friends. James 2, 24. See that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. Wow. All right, let's keep going. Um, the Pope, we hear a lot. Now, slide, you can look up on your screen. You can see the, the slide that says the papacy here, right? This is really confusing for people. Because people always say, you stupid Catholics think your Pope's infallible. Now, I gave a homily uh, a couple days ago where I talked about this. And um, so if you saw it, God bless you. Um, I'll just kind of summarize it here. The, the teaching of the church, in other words, do we believe the Pope is infallible? Yes, but with conditions. If the Pope said, 
And I, I used this example the other day. If the Pope said the University of Michigan is going to win the NCAA football national championship this year, is that true? Does that have to happen? Yes. No, just kidding. Just kidding. No, of course not. The Pope can be wrong just like you or me. The only time he is infallible is when he speaks ex cathedra from his chair, declaring it as infallible, or in union with his college of bishops, declaring it infallible in terms of faith and morals. Not social justice. Now, if the, if the Pope says that we shouldn't build a wall, or you think we should build a wall, and the Pope says we shouldn't, you can disagree. We are not blind sheep here. This is important. You know, Peter, the first pope, is mentioned 191 times in the Bible, and John is only mentioned 48. All the other apostles combined are only mentioned 130 times, yet Peter's mentioned 191 times. Because after the apostles died, this is important, that an authority was passed down, that more authority is needed to guard against heresy once the apostles died. So it makes perfect sense that we've got to continue this tradition, apostolic tradition in the chair of Peter. There has to be unity. Otherwise, you're going to have 40,000 different religions. That's what happened in the Protestant Reformation. We need to understand there has to be a unity. Every institution has to have a leader. Now, one of the most fascinating facts about the papacy I ever heard and learned in seminary, I said in the homily the other day, I want to repeat right here, if you ever question, and you can mention this to your non-Catholic brothers and sisters, about the authority of the Pope, listen to this. Around 80 AD, the church at Corinth had issues. And what apostle was still alive in 80 AD? You got it, John, the beloved disciple. But the church at Corinth, which was much closer, much closer to John and Patmos than, and I don't know if he was in Patmos at the time, but anyways, closer to John than Rome. Yet the church at Corinth, who did they go to? Did they go to John, the living apostle? Well, every non-Catholic in this world would say yes. But if you're a good Catholic and you know your, your history, you would say no. You know who they went to? Who did the church at Corinth go to to help them? Believe it or not, John, with his blessing, they went to Clement I, the fourth pope, even though John was still alive. The apostle who laid his head on the breast of Christ was still alive, yet the church at Corinth went to Clement I in Rome for guidance over John with John's blessing. John said, I am not the head of the church, Clement the first is, could you imagine this? Tell this to your non-Catholic friends. Again, I'm not lowering other religions. I'm elevating our Catholic faith where it belongs. This is so important. Now, even though John was still alive and living much closer to the church at Corinth than Rome was, the church at Corinth went to Clement, the first pope, with John's blessing. He told him he's the head of the church. Here's an apostle saying that I'm a, an apostle, but I'm not the head of the church. The Pope is. Wow. Have you ever heard that? Why aren't priests preaching this from the rooftops? I don't get it. All right. Do you know in the first 200 years, all the popes except one were martyred? I tell you, the Romans sure knew who the head of the church was because they sought him out and killed him. That is who the head of the church was. You know, a doctrine proposed by a pope as his own opinion and not solemnly declared as doctrine, infallible doctrine, may be regarded as false. You may disagree. Yes, you can. You know, I said this one, I want to give it before, I, I said it in my homily the other day, but I want to explain it. A lot of people will point to the fact that Peter is not the head of the church because of what the Bible says. <clears throat> and I need to teach you this for those who didn't hear my homily the other day, they will point to the Bible and say, go to the original Greek. That's always a good thing, right? What language were the Bibles written, was the Bible written in? Greek. So non-Catholics will say, go to the Greek. What does it say? It says, Peter, you are the rock that will build my church. No. It says, Petra. 
If it was Peter, it would have been Petros because the masculine Peter for rock would have been Petros. But instead, the Greek has Petra, which is feminine. So it could not be talking about Peter. It could not. What's the problem with that? And how should you answer that? That it's not talking about Peter when in fact we as Catholics believe it was talking about Peter. No, it isn't, Father, because it would have said Petros in the Greek. Instead, it said Petra, which is feminine. Peter was not feminine. Therefore, it could not be Peter. Aha. How do you know? How do you, how do you defend this? You know what the answer is? Jesus didn't speak Greek to his apostles. Never. Jesus spoke Aramaic. And in the Aramaic, there's only one word for rock, kepha. So Jesus would have said, you are kepha. And there's no way to know if he was meaning masculine or feminine. Why? Because he meant Peter. So he would have said in the Aramaic, kepha. He, there was no two versions of that in Aramaic, like the Greek. So when you say, oh, the Greek, it says Jesus says the feminine. It's not talking about Peter. Jesus didn't speak Greek. And so we got to know our faith to defend it like this. All right. I finish with the Pope because he is in scripture everywhere. What about Matthew 16, 18? Christ said that Peter was the rock upon which he would build the church. What about Luke 22, 32? Jesus gave Peter the mission to keep his faith and to strengthen his brothers as the leader. What about Matthew 16, 19? The keys were given to Peter to signify authority, the keys to heaven, meaning he had authority to govern the house of God that is the church. What about John 21 from 15 to 17 verses? Jesus gave Peter the authority by instructing him to feed his sheep after Jesus was to die. This means leader, everyone. Back to Matthew 16, 19. The power to bind and loose, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained, conferred Peter in particular, is seen, his confirmation is seen as authority to absolve sins. Not because Peter, the authority came from him, the authority came from God, came from Jesus, but when you have ultimate authority, you have the power to delegate that authority. And Peter had the ultimate, excuse me, Jesus had the ultimate authority to forgive sins and he delegated that to the apostles. John 19, uh, 16, excuse me, Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23. Well, okay, Father, but it died with the apostles. No, they had the authority to delegate it to others just like they did Matthias. And the next uh, ones that replaced those apostles is the next ordained clergy. You know, they had the authority to forgive sins and pronounce judgments on doctrine and to make decisions on church discipline. This is all scriptural. All right, next slide. Look up on your screen, saints and icons and relics. Number, this, this here is a number of questions and confusions that come from this, but look at that. Why do we have saints? This is one of the most confusing things ever. All right, let me try to explain why we have saints. Yes, we go directly to God. This is true. But you know what? If I wanted to get directly to the President of the United States, but I, I didn't yet know him, and I was trying to get to know him, but yet he had a personal good friend that was also somebody I could call, I would do that. I would use them as an advocate. This is all the saints are for us. They're examples. You know, who is the greatest NFL football player to ever live? Yes, Barry Sanders. That's right. Oh, I know I'm going to get comments. No, Father, Barry Sanders wasn't the greatest. Yes, he was. You know why Barry Sanders was the greatest NFL player who ever lived? Because he did all he did and never had a good offensive line in front of him and never had a good quarterback. And yet, he would, if, if he had an offensive line or a good quarterback, he would run, he'd still be running. And yet, Barry Sanders was more importantly a model of humility and character. He didn't do all these crazy things off the field. He was a humble man. When he'd score a touchdown, he'd flip the ball to the referee. He wouldn't go into some crazy celebration drawing attention to himself. He was the greatest football player who ever lived. 
And Barry Sanders is an example. So in the Detroit area where I'm from, when parents wanted their boys to play football, they wanted him to be like Barry Sanders because he was a great example. It's the same with the saints. You want to be a great person, you follow the saints. You want to model yourself after somebody, model yourself somebody. If I'm a priest, I want to model myself after John VNA, right? If you're striving for purity, you want to model yourself after uh, Maria Goretti. You can go down the list. And so these show us, these saints show us how to do it. You know, if there weren't saints before me that show that I can live a life of virtue, I don't think I ever would believe that I could live a celibate, chaste life in a way that I could crawl into my bed like I do every night all alone. No, I got to have that companionship. I want to be married. I can't live without that. Yes, you can, because the saints help me. The saints give me that example. And this is the beautiful gift God gives us in the saints. No, well, Father, you can't talk to saints. They're dead. Well, tell that to Jesus when he was transfigured on the mountain and he spoke to Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah were long dead. But Jesus was still talking to them. They could speak. Now, this is the same thing. We can ask them for prayers. Now, look at the next slide up on your screen. This is the Ark of the Covenant. And people say, Father, God prohibits graven images. Well, wait a minute. What are you seeing on your screen right there? That's a graven image. See the angels there? See the carvings on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? specifically done in pure detail the way God instructed it. He instructed them to carve graven images. But the point is, they, the Israelites weren't to worship those images. You see, Exodus 20, verse 4 says, God prohibits graven images for the purpose of worshiping them. We don't worship the statue of Mary that's off to my right. We don't. We, 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 we venerate what it represents I don't worship a statue of Jesus. I venerate who it represents, or excuse me, in the case of Jesus, I worship what it represents, not the image, but Jesus himself. The image just helps us to see it. You know, if, you, if you're all against graven images, then take every picture off your desk. If you say, you Catholics, you can't have graven images, well, then you need to throw away every picture on your desk because your picture of your family is a graven image. Just hopefully you're not worshiping it. Don't fall into that thing of child worship nowadays, right? The order of importance in your family is supposed to be God first, your spouse second, and your children third. That is the order of importance that is to be in your life. I have a good friend, she works here, and she said, Father, the most important thing to me in my life are my children first, my husband second, and God third. I said, well, that's beautiful, but you got it completely backwards. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> Exodus 25, 18, God commanded Moses to make a statue of the angels. And in number tw and, uh, Numbers 21, 8, even a bronze seraph to be able to carve it out and lift it up to the people so that they could look upon it and be healed. He instructed them to carve it out. Wow. This is unbelievable. Now, what about the Protestants? They have nativity scenes, right? Little Jesus in the, in the manger and everything. The statues of Joseph and Mary. They have Protestants. They have nativity scenes. That's the same thing. So I don't understand this confusion. Let's look at the next slide. What about icons? There's the icon of the divine mercy image. See it on your screen? That icon is a beautiful icon. This is the literal way that Christ teaches us who he is. From his heart comes the rays of blood and water to heal us. The white ray to cleanse us of sin and the red ray, blood, which means life to the Jews, to cleanse us, to protect us, and to, to um, uh, conquer death. These icons are, are important. They're not, I'm not worshiping the canvas or the frame or the paint. We worship what it represents, Christ himself. This is very important. All right. What about relics? You know, God can act through secondary agents, through relics, or even people. He acted through people, the apostles, and even objects. It says in the Bible, God acted through objects. Do you know this? What are our Catholic idea of relics? They're just simply objects that God works through, the same as the Bible tells us. Okay, go to the Bible. A man came back to life when he touched the bones of Elisha. This is 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 20. 
A man touched the bones of Elisha and he came back to life. That's a relic. God performed cures through Peter's shadow. Don't believe me? Acts 5 verse 15. And he did miracles through Paul's handkerchief. That's the ultimate in an example of a relic. Paul's handkerchief. You don't believe me? Acts 19 verse 11. God performed miracles through Paul's handkerchief, which would be a relic to us Catholics. All right. The relics don't perform the miracles themselves, but it's through the intercession of that saint, a friend of God already at his throne that can ask for help for us. All right, let's look at the next one, purgatory. This is a famous one. Purgatory is one that a lot of people say, you Catholics, purgatory, the word purgatory is not in the Bible. Yeah, you're right. But the whole concept, neither is Trinity. All Christians believe in the Trinity, but is the word Trinity in the Bible? No. So what do we do? Look at purgatory. 1 Corinthians 3 says that man can be saved only through fire. Did you hear that? 1 Corinthians 3, man can only be saved through fire. Now, here's the interesting thing. In hell, no one can be saved. And in heaven, there is no fire. So how could that statement in the Bible make any sense? In heaven, souls don't need any aid. And in hell, they cannot be saved. Therefore, there has to be a middle state. This is what is purgatory. In fact, 2 Maccabees 12 says that the soldiers made atonement for the dead so they might be delivered from their sin. If you're making atonement for the dead, if they're in heaven, they don't need atonement. If they're in hell, they can't be made atonement for. So that this means there has to be a middle ground. The Jews, they prayed for their own dead. They still do today. Early Christian tombs, it's written all over, ask for prayers of the dead. This has been a Christian tradition since the days of Christ. All right, the Jews, early Christians, even St. Paul, all prayed for the dead, but it presumes that there's a state of needed purification. All right, most are not so good, most people I know are not so good that they should go right to heaven without any kind of cleaning up. Yet most people are not so bad that they deserve eternal damnation either. Some, yes. But the point is, it makes sense to have purgatory. It's a mercy of God to clean us up. It's kind of like the bride. Doesn't the bride, before she meets her groom, want to go to the separate room away, separated from the groom, and get cleaned up and put on makeup and do her hair and, 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 and all that? Yeah. Because the importance is she wants to be ready when she meets her groom. So anyway, there are a lot of passages in the Bible like paying the last penny and being released from prison. All right, let's go to the next slide, the church. Isn't that a beautiful picture of a church? I tell you, you want to see the most beautiful churches in the world? Go to downtown Detroit. Believe it or not, people, downtown Detroit, yes, those churches rival like the sweetest heart of Mary, St. Jehoshaphat. That one right there on your screen is, um, uh, is a beautiful church. Unfortunately, it's, it's closed now. Um, but anyway... There's so many other beautiful ones still remaining. Um, but they rival Europe, in my opinion. Um, anyway, um, let's talk about this. Is the church needed for salvation? This is where I want to wrap up. I got just one more set of notes here. Is the church needed for salvation? Yes, it is. The church has always taught that there's no salvation outside of Jesus. And Jesus' body is the church. Other religions can, now, wait a minute, let me back up. So if the, is the church teaching there's no, out, there's no salvation outside the Catholic church? Is that what the church is teaching? Yes, actually. But it doesn't mean you have to be a member of the four walls, registered member sitting in the pew every Sunday. Doesn't mean that. That's not what it means. This is where it gets a little tricky. All right, as I said, there's no salvation without Jesus, and Jesus' body is the church. So therefore, there is no salvation outside the church. Now, other religions can be united with the Catholic church, albeit imperfectly. Like our Protestant brothers and sisters, they still are united with us through scripture. All right? So this is important stuff. So no salvation outside the church is true. But as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a registered member. 
The Catholic Church is found in your heart. This is important. So, can a pygmy in the rainforest be saved? Yes, because he's, but he, Father, he's never read the Bible or been to Mass. You're telling me that you need the Catholic Church. Okay, let's look at this. That pygmy in the rainforest will be judged entirely different than you and me. You see, yes, that pygmy in the rainforest never had a chance to know scripture or the mass, and partly that's our fault, okay? If you wanna make sure that you help spread the gospel to the world, you have a couple choices. You can either pack up and go out to the ministry of missions uh, to all corners of the world, or you can support our ministry work here at the Marian Fathers. You wanna do that? You wanna be the hands and feet of Christ in the world? Go to micprayers.com and find out how to become a member of the Association of Marian Helpers. And you can become the hands and feet of Jesus through our work, through our prayers, and, or excuse me, through your prayers and support. We do that work of Christ and you're united to us. Just like I said, you can be united to the Catholic Church, albeit not perfectly, but you can be united. You guys can be united to us through members of the Association of Marian Helpers because in the members of the Association of Marian Helpers, you receive all the graces of our prayers, rosaries, penances, just like you were a member of the Mar uh, Marian, just like you were a Marian priest. Now, I'm sorry I didn't make a slide for Brother Mark to show, but again, that's M-I-C for Marians of the Immaculate Conception, prayers.com. Well, anyway, back to the pygmy. Can a pygmy in the rainforest be saved? Yes. But Father, he didn't go to Mass, he didn't receive sacraments, he, he didn't read the Bible. Okay, that's not his fault, all right? It's invincible ignorance, Augustine used to talk about. So he will be judged entirely different. He will be judged by the natural law that God put in his heart to be the best pygmy he can be. Now, it's funny because somebody once wrote my superior and said, Father Chris said that only Catholics and pygmies in the rainforest can be saved. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that God's mercy is extended to everybody, but in different ways. You see, to us Catholics, it's given in its fullness. God's grace and mercy is given in its fullness to the Catholic Church. Doesn't mean a non-Catholic can't still be saved, but it's a lot harder it's because they don't have the gift of the sacraments and the truth that we are given. So don't leave your Catholic faith. Your Catholic faith is the way to get you to heaven. Yes, a pygmy in the rainforest can be saved, but he's judged entirely different than you and me. He'll be judged how we live the natural law. Not only will we be judged how we live the natural law, but we'll also be judged if we use the tools God gave us for salvation. On our judgment day, we will be told, did you use the tools I gave you for salvation? What are those tools? Confession, Holy Communion, the Mass, the Eucharist, the gift of a mother. These are all tools God gave us for salvation. Why would you not want to use it? To whom much is given, much more is expected. This is throughout the Bible. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying you've been given the supersonic jet airliner. When, if you're in New York and you want to get to LA, you have a couple ways you can do it. All right. <clears throat> One, you could walk. That's like non-Christians. Can non-Christians get to heaven? Yes, they can. But it's a difficult journey because they are given none of the truth in the sacraments or anything like that. It's not their fault, but it's just a gift that has been given in the fullness through Christ. If they don't know Christ, but God puts on their hearts other ways, they can still get from New York to LA by walking, but it's dangerous. You could be attacked by bears, you could be run over by a bus, but you couldn't do it with a lot of hard work. And I tell you, there are some non-Catholic, non-Christians that are working a heck of a lot harder than we are. And in fact, they might get to heaven before us because of how hard they work at it. Praying seven times a day, okay? This is a love of their faith. Now, it does not mean it's the trueness of the faith. They can get to heaven, but it's going to be a much harder road. They can possibly make it, but they have to be basically walking from New York to LA. It's a hard journey. Then you could drive. That's kind of like our... Christian non-Catholic brothers, um, our Protestant brothers, they're like driving New York to LA. They've been given the, the car of scripture. 
So yeah, they can get New York to LA, but it's still a little bit of a long journey. You're gonna have pitfalls along the way. You can get flat tires. Um, you have a lot of trials and tribulations, but you can, you can make it. It's just, again, a lot more work. Or you can get on a supersonic jet airliner and fly straight from New York to LA, the surest, quickest, fastest way, a supersonic jet airliner. And that is the church. Why? Because they give you all the fuel and the vessel by which to get there. That vessel you're sitting in is the church and it's propelled by the fuel of the sacraments. This is what the Catholic faith is. So you can either walk, you can either ride a car, or you can get in a supersonic jet airliner and be projected straight to your destination through the power and the truth of the sacraments. This is what we have in our Catholic church. We will not be judged in the same way as non-Catholics. We will be judged actually harder. That's not to be scary. What it means is to be is use those tools God gave you. If you're building a house and, and you, all you got is a hammer and a nail and I come over with a boatload of power tools, you'd be crazy not to use those power tools to build that house. That's what we're talking about here. All right. We were given the gift of the sacraments and these are our ways to heaven. This is powerful. All right, well, Father, you talk about all this truth in your Catholic faith. I've heard some bad things about your Catholic church. Let's look at the next slide. Who's this guy? This guy is Galileo. And you know what? I, I've heard so many times, you got to read the story of Galileo to see what the real truth is, all right? Galileo, in the whole story there, is such a black eye to the Catholic faith, undeservedly so. All right, first of all, Galileo was never told by the Catholic Church he was wrong. First of all, it wasn't even Galileo. If you remember the story, Galileo basically said that the earth is not the center of the universe and the earth revolves around the sun. Well, first of all, the Catholic Church never told him he was wrong, but it wasn't even his idea. He took that idea from Copernicus, a Catholic priest, Polish, I think he was, and Galileo was not told he was wrong. The church simply told him to teach it as a hypothesis because he had no way to prove it yet. We didn't have the science yet to prove the earth wasn't the center of the universe and rotated around the sun. So the church said, teach it as a hypothesis rather than definitive truth. And Galileo didn't listen. He taught it as definitive truth. Yes, he happened to be right, but the church was simply trying to protect what appeared to be something that contradicted scripture. Now we see later, it doesn't contradict scripture, but it appeared to. Since it appeared to contradict scripture, the church was simply protecting the Bible. Why is this so bad? And no, he wasn't beaten and thrown into chains by the Catholic church. There was some disciplinary actions, but I'm disciplined if I'm obedient to my superiors too. This is, uh, this is such a huge misconception. Let's look at the next slide, the Crusades. Oh, this one's a big one. This is, a, oh, Father, the Crusades, we even had a former president that talked about this and the rotten things the Christian did. Well, I tell you what that former president failed to inform you of is why those Crusades were called in the first place. The Crusades were put together to protect pilgrims that were being slaughtered and beheaded in Jerusalem. That's why those, those were put together. Now, this is not fully the truth in terms of just saying the Crusades were all good. No, we did some stupid things. The Christian soldiers that ransacked Constantinople on the Fourth Crusade was dumb, dumb, dumb. The Christians did some stupid things too. But the purpose of the Crusades was to protect pilgrims and to stop the onslaught of Islam as it was as, 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 as the wars were going on. And, 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 and yes, both sides did bad things. Both sides. So I don't mean to just target one religion or say one religion is good and one's religion is bad. No, I'm just saying the intent of the Crusades was to protect pilgrims. Does that mean that they didn't do anything bad? Yes, the Christian soldiers did. They did do things that were stupid. Again, I point to Constantinople. Sacking that city was dumb. And so both sides did stupid things. It wasn't just the side of the Christians. That's what I'm trying to point out here. It wasn't just the Christians that were bad in the Crusades. Both sides made mistakes, okay? Both sides had good intentions and both sides made bad mistakes. All right, now, what about the Inquisition? 
The Inquisition, oh, Father, that's where the Catholic Church totally burned people at the stake and made all kinds of um, uh, horrible things to the people who wouldn't become Catholic. Well, there's two sides to this story, and we need to need history because it was actually two um, evangelical preachers that really falsified the truth of the Inquisition. First of all, it was not the church that was predominantly putting people to death. It was the state, Spain, France, and Italy. These were the places. The carried Inquisition was carried out by the state. In fact, most people in the Inquisition wanted their cases heard by the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church was intervening or interceding for them for their for their their safety because they were um the, the state was carrying out the executions now again does that mean the church didn't make mistakes yes she did but the purpose of the inquisition was carried out by the states of spain mostly and uh um, and in italy and france and so what we have in that is an understanding oh the church has this huge black eye from the inquisition well we need to know the full truth the church was doing, trying to help people, and many people came to the church and wanted them to hear their cases in the Inquisition, to trying to help them. Now again, it doesn't mean they didn't make mistakes, they did. All right, let's go with a few more to finish. Call no one your father. That's what I hear all the time. Well, too bad, because the fourth commandment says, father, and even in scripture. What about the parable in Luke, 16, chapter 16, verse 24? Father Abraham. It says right in Luke, Father Abraham. But wait a minute, the, the Bible says, call no one your father. Well, the Bible calls people father. They call him Father Abraham in Luke 16. What about St. Paul, who calls religious leaders fathers in Acts of the Apostles, seven, chapter 7, verse 2, and in chapter 22, verse 1? What about St. Paul telling the Corinthians, I became your father? Too bad that wasn't in the Gospel of Luke, because then we could say, Luke, I am your father, <laughs> right? All right, just sorry, a little levity there. Paul tells the Corinthians, I am your father. So you see, we have to understand spiritual father, right? This is important. All right, let's go on. What about infant baptism? Oh, I don't want, I can't baptize him until he wake until he grows up to be 18 and then he can make the choice himself uh-uh that's not what the christians did and in fact when your child was born did you say i'm going to give my child 18 years to determine if he wants to be in my family or not no that's craziness you don't change the family god put you into and none of you here when your child was born said i'm going to wait for him to be 18 and let him decide if he wants to be a member of our family the reason we baptize infants is because it's in it's immediately determining them to be members of God's family. You know, in the, um, uh, the uh, Bible, the apostles baptized entire households, including the children. In the Old Testament, a child became a part of the Old Covenant through circumcision on the eighth day. Baptism is now replaced circumcision. So if the Bible did it on the eighth day of the child's birth, why not us? At eighth day after the child's birth, all right? In baptism, we become citizens of God's kingdom, adopted children of God. This is required for heaven. Why would we want to deny even a child his, his right to now be an adopted child of God? The Bible says we must have the baptism. Well, baptize the children. Jesus said, let the children come to me, all right? We are all born with Adam's sin even children, well, especially children. So we need baptism. The children even need that wiped away. And, 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 and this is important. Okay, what about this one? Jesus is the one mediator. There's nobody else who's a mediator. You call Mary a mediator, you're wrong. All right, let's look at this. Yes, Jesus is the one mediator, but there are sub-mediators, co-workers with Christ in the garden. Um, Co, like a co-mediator or co-redemptress like Mary, co-redemptress. Co or cum in the Latin, C-U-M, means with. It doesn't mean instead of. So when Mary is co-redemptress, it means she's with Jesus. She participated by giving him his flesh and his body. She worked with Jesus, not instead of Jesus. God share um, his unique role with us. 
This is very important. God is creator, and now we procreate. God created. Well, then what about man and woman coming together in marriage and creating a baby? Because God invites us to participate in his procreation. That's why a husband and wife come together and they participate in procreation. They form the child. It's God's child, but they participate in God's creative act. It's the same way in mediation. All right. There's one shepherd. That's Jesus. But the Bible calls Peter a shepherd. You see, this is important. All right, what about once saved, always saved? Well, be careful there, because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we must persevere to the end. All right, what about, um, you know, only our leaders, as I said before, can trace their authority back to the apostles. That was the beauty I described of the apostolic succession, another point to be made here. Um, here's the bottom line, everybody. The church established... I should say Christ established the church to teach, govern, and sanctify his name until the very end. And to reject the authority of the church is to reject Christ and his gospel. All right. I'm only going to cover one more here because we're running out of time. And I want to touch just a few words on the church scandal. As you see on your slide, we are under the magnifying glass, the church scandal, and we should be. This, there's no words that I can say that can justify or excuse any of you who have been a victim of clergy abuse. It is unacceptable, it's absolutely deplorable, and I pray for those priests or clergy because their souls are in jeopardy. First and foremost, I pray for you if you are a victim of the scandal in any way. Again, there is nothing I can say to justify it or to explain it or to rationalize it or to give any justification to it. There is none. But I would like to say, with that being said, there's been an attack in the media that has taken this horrible part of the truth, and it's a reality, this, nobody's denying that, but exploding it into something to make it look even different as horrible as it is, even look worse. What do I mean by this? All right, as I said before, the church is both human and divine. In her humanness, she can fail. She can fall to scandal. In her divine nature, she will never fail. But here's what I want to point out. Do you know that this is a published statistic? You can look it up. 85% of child abuse happens in the home. 14% in schools, sports, and extracurricular activity. 1% happens in religious institutions. And of that, the Catholic Church is at the lower half. There are scandals in all denominations. Am I trying to say that this isn't a problem? It's a gigantic problem. One case is too many. All I'm trying to say is if you think this is just a Catholic problem, you're wrong. It's a broken humanity problem. Do you know that in the general population, 4% are pedophiles? This is sad, and these people need prayers. Amongst the priests, it's 1%. So in the general population, you have four times the percentage of people who are pedophiles than you have amongst the priesthood. It breaks my heart when I go through an airport and I'm shouted at, pedophile, when actually the priest statistically is only a fraction of pedophiles compared to the general population. But not one single priest should fall into this. Not one. And please, if you are aware of it, you must report him. Please report him to the authorities if you are aware of this. It's unacceptable. But again, it's not just a Catholic problem as the media is portraying it. The media portrays this. I was stopped in the airport and I was told by a guy that this only happens amongst Catholic priests. I should be ashamed to be a Catholic priest because this problem only happens among Catholic priests. And it shows that the Catholic Church is not the true faith of Christ. My answer was, you know what? You're right. It should never happen. But 
We don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Yes, we have had some bad priests and bishops. We've had some deplorable priests and bishops. Judas was a deplorable disciple, but none of the other disciples left Jesus because of him. Please don't leave your Catholic faith because of the few bad priests and bishops that we've had. And there have been some. I'm not going to deny that. And should they have been hidden and swept under the rug? Absolutely not. If you're aware of it, please report it. You know, most pedophiles are married men. So it's not about celibacy. Many of the TV evangelists in the evangelical world have fallen. It's not just a Catholic problem. What this need means is all people need prayer. Um, my dad, we are a military family. My dad was talking about, you know, the military, and he was furious when the scandal broke, and he should have been. And I asked my father, I said, Dad, I said, did you leave the Marine Corps, or did you leave the military when you found out about our bad generals? You know, MacArthur, there's a bad general. Sent 1,200 men needlessly to the death at Peleliu. Uh, general Custer from my hometown of Monroe, Michigan, actually was a bad general. Never won any major battles except against Indian women and children. And then he led his men into slaughter at Little Bighorn because his ego didn't allow him to wait for Reno or Benteen, his fellow officers. That was a bad general. But dad, did you leave the military? Did you quit the Marines because of those bad generals? No. You stood up and you stood for what was right. I implore all of you, don't tolerate this in our church. Stand up and do what's right. Don't run from your faith, make it better. Expose the, the scum and let's clean it up. If it's a priest or a bishop, let's do that. You see, of the 12 apostles, one betrayed Christ, one denied him, one refused to even believe in his resurrection. You see, Jesus didn't pick all winners either. Jesus didn't pick an all-star team. He picked broken men. Those same broken men of the apostles, one who betrayed him, one who denied him, and one who refused to believe in the resurrection were still people Jesus had picked. They all abandoned him after the Garden of Gethsemane, and they all abandoned him at the cross except one, John. Man is weak. Don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Stand for what is right and try, try to pray as much we can, especially for the victims and even for the priests. That's hard, but they need your help, all of them. And I, again, pray that all of us can heal and move forward. We need good priests. Pray for us. Pray for the priests. The church needs it. We, the world needs the church. And we need the church for salvation. As broken as we are, it's a beautiful act of God's mercy that even in this day and age, full of a world in despair, the church is the beacon of light. Please don't abandon ship. You know, this church is like Noah's Ark. It's even shaped like an ark, really. And in this church, we have the refuge. Stay aboard. You can jump over and maybe try to swim to shore. You might make it, but you also might get eaten by a shark. Stay in the protection of the vessel. And we have to clean up this vessel. And right now, God is doing that so that you'll know you'll be on the cleanest vessel on, on board. You know, the coronavirus, they're talking about you can't get on the cruise ships until they make sure that they are sterilized. Stay on Noah's Ark, this ship called the church, because right now she's being sterilized. She's being cleaned up. She's being purified. All this is being exposed, praise be to God, so that you can get back on your ship and ride that steady course to your destination, which is heaven. So this is where I want to leave you today. I apologize because I did not get to the two biggest parts of the Catholic faith. And they are going to be so big that I'm going to make my two next week's talk their subject. It is Mary and the Eucharist. So as you see on your screen, Mary and the Eucharist are going to be my next two topics the next two Saturdays at 11 o'clock. They are so big, there was no way that I could fit them into this talk today because they, they deserve their own special days. So please join me next week as I tell you about the role of Mary, and I promise you, you will never, ever, ever look at Mary the same. 
when we explain to you why Mary was given to us and what her rule is for us, you're gonna be like, how could I ever not have used this help God gave me? She is help. She's not instead of God. She is God's help to us as a mother. God knew in the garden when, when we fell that we were gonna be skittish creatures and he wanted to give us a mother to take care of us. And that's exactly what Mary does. So please join me next week, same time, 11 o'clock on Saturday, as I talk about our Blessed Mother. And then the following Saturday will be a talk about the Eucharist and Holy Communion, and hopefully the churches will be back open by then, and you can see the pure value and the necessity of Holy Communion. And so, before I give the final blessing, I want you to look on the screen. There is a DVD. All these talks that I've been given to you are just bits and pieces from my DVD called Explaining the Faith. And that, Brother Mark is gonna leave that on the screen for a while so you can write it down. And I'm just gonna talk over it. So on the screen, you can see explaining the faith. You want the, the basic talk I gave today, it's on there. You want the basic talk I gave last week, a confession, it's on there. You want the basic talk I gave on explaining the mass and the walkthrough of the mass, it's on there. Mary, I talked about Mary, I'll mention her next week. That's on that DVD. You wanna talk on um, the Eucharist, that's on the DVD. Wanna know why God would allow suffering in this world? Why would he allow it? That's on the DVD. Um, um, what does the church teach on things like suicide? Have you experienced tremendous loss of a loved one? Not just a suicide, but any kind of means. Is there hope for their salvation? And can you help them even years after if you weren't praying at the time? Yes, you can. That talk is on there. So on that DVD called Explaining the Faith, you can visit our website, shopmercy.org, okay? And it's right on the front page. Please order the DVD to share with your parish, to share with those loved ones and your family. It's great for small groups in the churches. Um, please get it. Now, if you don't like a DVD or Father, I don't have a DVD player, look at the bottom of your screen. If you go to the divinemercy.org slash explaining the faith, you can actually live stream this. So if you want the DVD because of our production costs and the boxing and the printing and the DVD itself, it's $14.95. Or if you want to, to get the um, live stream, it is the divinemercy.org slash explaining the faith and you can start watching it tonight. So hopefully you'll get that. Now, as we come back to me here at the AMBO, I want to be able to give you a final blessing, but I want to thank you again for staying with me. And next week, we'll talk about our blessed mother. So thank you for joining us. And through the intercession of St. Faustina and through Mary and all the saints and through the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, may Almighty God bless you and all of yours, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God bless you. And I forgot one last thing. Please join me this Thursday on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And I'm sorry, I didn't have a slide put up for this one, but Virgin Most Powerful Radio. You can go and hear the audio on vmpr.org for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. So vmpr.org or to the Virgin Most Powerful Radio app. If you want to see us on video, just go to uh, uh, YouTube to the Virgin Most Powerful Radio radio channel and starting Thursday at three o'clock my radio show will be uh, we'll have guests we'll talk about the faith we'll talk about real life stories and examples that will grow from these talks that I'm giving you here today so please join us again on Thursday of every week at 3 p.m. Eastern time as I bring you the show called understanding divine mercy it's my new radio show that we're gonna bring the living faith and put it alive. So please join us as we talk to with you starting this Thursday, the 28th. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.